Hi, everyone, and welcome to The Debrief. This week, we're talking about the newly announced participants for the October meeting in Rome for the Synod on Synodality. We're talking about the Holy Father naming 21 new cardinals, and we'll wrap with the latest controversy surrounding Father James Altman. This and more with Mike Lewis on The Debrief. Well, First of all, I want to apologize to everyone. I want to apologize to Dominic for dropping the ball two weeks in a row. Uh, I want to thank Adam Rasmussen for jumping in last Sunday and filling in. And we did a supersize debrief geek out special with uh, with me and Adam. Um, but yeah, nice to see you. No, it's good to be back. Life happens. Um, we've had a ton of rain, so my internet's been spotty. But it's good to be back. And um News didn't stop, so we're going to just just keep plowing right in, and and we're grateful to everybody who is leaving comments in the community and asking questions. Um, yeah, there's a lot going on. Okay, well, let's, let's just get into it, Mike. Last week, the Synod released the names of the people who will be participating in the October 2023 and 2024 assemblies in Rome. Can you explain who these people are, how many, where do they come from? Give us an overview. Okay, so basic overview is that this year, um, this week, they announced for the for the upcoming meeting, and actually these names apply to both meetings, all of the delegates and participants in the actual synodal assembly in Rome with the Pope. Um, every country with every bishop's conference gets a certain amount of delegates that they appoint. There are um, certain, uh, you know, I think the U.S. bishop's conference got six you know, smaller countries got fewer. Um, the heads of, of various dicasteries in Rome, like the prefect for the DDF, the uh, dicastery for the doctrine of the faith, Archbishop Fernandez, who we spoke about a lot while you <laughs> in our um, episode with Adam, and he, he'll definitely be a figure in future episodes of the debrief. Um, you know, Cardinal Kevin Farrell is a is a is a U.S. Cardinal originally from Ireland, but a lot of these people are automatically named. The people who are on the staff of the Synod, and then um, there's what's different is that all participants can vote in the Synod, including women, including lay people, including priests. So no longer is it just the Synod of bishops; it is the Synod. Um, the vast majority of participants, I believe, are still bishops. I think women maybe make up 12 or 15% of, of the appointees. Mm -hmm. um, the laity is split between, between women and men, but it is uh, a truly global synod. Um, you know, it's not, it's not a, a, a purely representative body, but we wanted to make sure that almost every demographic was covered. Although... I will say that there was one area that was missed and it was pointed out to me by a deacon. He said, there's oh, really? not a single deacon on the huh. entire list of 363 representatives. So and if anyone from the, uh, from the Synod or in the Vatican is watching, that's uh, maybe something that can be rectified. The list obviously isn't final. There could be changes made. I, mm -hmm. I am aware that this list does cover this year and next year, mm -hmm. but obviously people pass away, people's uh, responsibilities change. It's sometimes difficult to take an international trip two years in a row so that I'm sure there will be some fluctuation in between. Mm -hmm. um, but anyway, that's uh, that's the broad overview. It's a lot of big okay. names in the church. Amazing. So um, we have a, a list of U.S. participants. Do we want to have a look at those? Yeah. And so there was an article that was uh, put, put up by... Um, America, I believe Mike O'Glaughlin, their U.S. correspondent, put it together, actually mm -hmm. missed a couple of Americans on the list. So uh -huh. um, I wanted to be semi-comprehensive. Uh, first, I think he put a couple of non-voting uh, witnesses that would be or advisors that would be there uh, that were American. They're not on my list, but I wanted to go through and, and by going through the U.S. delegation, which is one of the larger delegations in the world, uh, sort of talk about the the thought processes and the types of people who were named um, to participate in the Synod. So the very first group is a group of bishops that were elected um, by the members of the USCCB. 
Um, at the top is Bishop Daniel Flores, the Bishop of Brownsville, Texas, who is the head of the Doctrine Committee for the USCCB. And um, he's significant because he is one of the main drafters of the working document, and he's part of the President uh, Committee for the, I, I think, it's a group of about eight different bishops from all over the world, including Japan. Um, and so he's one of the key figures in the Synod, and he's an up and coming bishop um, in Brownsville, Texas. Uh, the second on the list is Archbishop Timothy Brolio, who is the president of the USC CCB, and he is the uh, Archbishop of the Archdiocese of Military Services USA. Um, Cardinal Timothy Dolan, the Archbishop of New York, who is also uh, a past president of the USCCB. Bishop Kevin Rhodes of Fort Wayne, South Bend, Indiana, was the previous uh, Doctrine Committee head. Bishop Robert Barron, who all of you know uh, from Word on Fire, from his videos, um, very big on social media. He is one of the representatives. He's, I believe, the head of the Evangelization Committee for the USCCB. Uh, oh, okay. there's, um, an Eastern uh, bishop, uh, Archbishop, Bishop Skirla, who is the um, Byzantine eparch of Pittsburgh. So um, not a lot of Eastern Catholics in the U.S., but we definitely mm -hmm. have rep representation from all the Eastern churches. So it's good that they have a voice in, in the synodal process. Now, one thing that people might say looking at this list is that... Um, you know, looking at it from maybe a political or an ideological point of view, um, this group leans to the right a little bit. Um, and so uh, Pope Francis, with his own discretion, um, mm -hmm. appointed a number of bishops of his own volition that weren't picked. So this group of his own designees is includes four cardinals. Oops. Where did that one go? Four cardinals, um, mm -hmm. three of which he named. So Cardinal Blaise Supich of Chicago, Wilton Gregory of Washington, D.C., Robert McElroy of San Diego. He also appointed Cardinal Sean O'Malley of Boston, who is approaching retirement age. I believe he's about to turn. I think he just turned 79. Um, okay. He's also the head of the Pontifical Commission for uh, the Protection of Minors, and he is a member of the um, the C9 committee, the nine key cardinals that uh, that assist Pope Francis. So he's an important name, and he's been seen as an important ally of Pope Francis. Another interesting pick is Archbishop Paul Achen of Seattle, who uh, he was recently named to Seattle, well, maybe three or four years ago. Um, prior to that, he was the um, Archbishop of Anchorage, Alaska, but he is, uh, I wouldn't say he's progressive but, or has that reputation, but he's on the more moderate side of the church in the U.S., and he was, I believe, maybe the third place uh, vote getter in the USCCB presidential race. So he's, I guess you would say he was a, le he's a leader of the moderate, moderate wing of mm -hmm. the um, U.S. Episcopate. And then finally, uh, appointed by the Pope is Father James Martin, mm -hmm. the Jesuit priest who um, we have... Uh, You've interviewed with him in the past, haven't you? I've interviewed him for the field yeah. hospital. Um, you know, I've spoken to him a number of times. Mm -hmm. um, it's funny because his name is almost radioactive or, or yeah. toxic for some people mm -hmm. on the on the far Catholic right. Right. Um, in terms of being an institutional figure, a lot of, you know, he gets along with a lot of, a lot of figures in the church. He speaks at dioceses and at universities. Um, part of his mission, he doesn't, uh, cross any church teachings, like, uh, contradict anything about sexual morality, but he is known for his LGBTQ ministry mm -hmm. and even using that acronym, is seems to be triggering for some people in the U.S. Church, mm -hmm. um, and so he's he's kind of used as a contrast and as a firebrand. I think that what Pope Francis is trying to do here is to say that we need diverse voices to participate. Mm -hmm. um, one of the things that is interesting in the German delegation, 
the bishops who were elected tended to be on the more progressive side mm -hmm. and the bishops that Pope Francis appointed for the Germans tended to be more conservative. And one of the big names from the German delegation is Cardinal Gerhard Mueller, who was okay. the former prefect for the Congregation of the Doctrine of the Faith. He's been very critical of Pope Francis. He's been very critical of the Synod. Mm -hmm. But as a former prefect, as, a, as an accomplished theologian, Pope Francis extended an olive branch and uh, invited him to the Synod. Now, I don't know if there are any names on par mm -hmm. with Mueller. He is the one that kind of jumped out to everybody. Uh, other critical cardinals and bishops like Cardinal Seurat or Cardinal Burke were not invited. But it is interesting to see actually all three of the living prefects for the congregation of or De Castri for the doctrine of the faith are will be present. So Cardinal Ledi, Luis Ladaria, who will be retiring, mm -hmm. is the um, he's the uh, you know I guess he's still current. I don't know when the date changes over, but he'll be replaced by Archbishop, soon to be Cardinal uh, Victor Fernandez. So um, let me go down a little bit more. So adding to the um, to the U.S. Senate delegation. Um, mm -hmm are takes a little time for this to come up so cardinal joseph tobin of newark is on the synod committee or he or he's part of maybe the synod office so he's an automatic um participant um cardinal kevin farrell who's used to be a uh an auxiliary bishop here in washington dc and he was the bishop of dallas for a while uh, he's an Ireland native, as I mentioned before, but he, because he's the prefect of the dicastery for the lady family and life, is an automatic attendee. And then another name um, is Cardinal Designate Robert Prevost. Um, he's an Augustinian uh, missionary who was serving as a bishop in Peru, but he has been promoted by Pope Francis fairly recently uh, as the prefect for the dicastery for bishops, uh, re replacing the Canadian Cardinal Mark Willett. So, you know, he identifies, I think, as Peruvian because that's where he came from, just like Farrell uh, is American. But I think once you're in Rome, it's almost a, mm -hmm. an international experience. And then the final uh, group here is a group of people who are synod bound and they will have votes, is my understanding. It's a group mm -hmm. of religious sisters and of laity and a young parish priest. Um, Cynthia Bailey Manns is uh, an adult faith formation director in Minnesota. Richard Cole is a USCCB staff member who's been their point man for the um, for the Synod. And I, I worked with him. He's a mm -hmm. he's a very, very kind man and, and, you know, very, I mean, very good hearted man. So anyone on that staff, he's probably the best choice. Um, Leticia Salazar is uh, she's a sister who's the chancellor for the Diocese of San Bernardino in, in California, and she has extensive experience with mm -hmm. uh, migrants. Uh, there's a Polish student, uh, Julia Oseka, who is a student at St. Joe's in Philadelphia, and she's studying theology and physics. And there are actually some articles about her. I was just starting to learn about her particip participation mm -hmm. in the Senate, but she's a very promising young person. Uh, another college student, Wyatt Olivas of the Diocese of Cheyenne will be in a student at the University of Wyoming will be participating. And finally, uh, Father Ivan Montelo Montelongo, um, who is a young parish priest mm -hmm. in the Diocese of El Paso, which is right on the border of um, the U.S. and Mexico, will be participating as well. Um, he's only been ordained th three years. Um, mm -hmm. I know that Pope Francis, in a recent interview, spoke very well of um, his bishop, Mark Seitz. Um, and it, it was funny because Pope Francis is like, it was saying something to the effect of, you have a bishop in the U.S. And it was in the interview with America. I don't know if he's liberal or conservative, uh, but Bishop Seitz, because he's with the people and he supports the migrants and the poor. Um, so... Anyway, the, I guess uh, Father Ivan is the the shining star of um, the uh, uh, of the Diocese of El Paso, maybe. But uh, I actually um, he follows me on Twitter, so I messaged him the other day and so <laughs> okay. wished him well. So he's 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 very exciting, excited to be going, mm -hmm. and uh, 
I don't know if this is, uh, well, the seal of confessional is only the priest side. So I basically, I said, so are you ready to write uh, your four minute intervention? Because basically everybody, all of the participants get four minutes up on the stage okay. and um, to, to talk about whatever they want. And he said he hadn't even thought about it yet. So we'll see, <laughs> you know, to speak to all the bishops and the Pope, mm -hmm. um, you know, it's your one chance to shine. So I that's uh, be a lot to talk about when those land. Yeah. And so I, that was just an overview that I wanted to give. But, um, you know, to sort of talk about the balance that that was brought out, I think that Pope Francis definitely has his idea of which priests in the, you know, it, or which bishops in the U.S. church are following closer to his mold. Um, and so I think that his picks were mm -hmm. reflective of that to help balance out the U.S. group. So speaking of picks, we have 21 new cardinals. And I mean, that seems like a, a hefty number. And 18 of them are under 80 with the consistory taking place on September 30th. Any highlights you can point to in the American? Well, delivery? yes. And well, so here's the thing. As I mentioned, um, Bishop Robert Prevost, who is the, the um, prefect for the Dicastery of Bishops, mm -hmm. will be named a cardinal. He is a born a native born American, but he's been living in, in Peru, but he is being named a cardinal, um, as is Archbishop Victor Fernandez, um, the Bishop of Hong Kong. And one surprise pick is Archbishop Pierre, who we've spoken about on the on the debrief a couple of times. He's the US uh papal nuncio. Mm -hmm. Um up until I believe about two nuncios ago, there was always a tradition that the the papal delegate would, when they retired from the U.S., they would go back and they'd get named a cardinal. Mm -hmm. um, and then two nuncios ago, um, he actually died in office, the nuncio, towards wow. the end of his term. Mm -hmm. And then his successor was Archbishop Vigano, who did mm -hmm. not get made a cardinal. Um, and I was thinking because... Uh, Archbishop Pierre is getting close to getting close to 80. He's 77 now. So um, he's beyond the, you know, he's beyond the retirement age, but 80 is sort of the cutoff mandatory retirement age. Um, so it was a nice little gesture of Pope Francis to name him Cardinal. And I definitely think in terms of the message that he's been giving to the U.S. bishops, which we discussed, mm -hmm. um, he I think this is this sends another message, or, is, or it's a bit of validation. Um, I think that Pierre, you know, he's an experienced diplomat for the Vatican. One of the one of the things that he uh, that he always points out, I've heard, is that he's never served in Rome. He's always mm -hmm. been in the field. So he's been the nuncio, I believe, in Uganda. He's served in Cuba. Before coming to the U.S., he was in Mexico. I think it's a total of nine countries that he's served and four countries where he's been the nuncio. And mm -hmm. so um, in honor of this longstanding service to the church and, and church diplomacy, he is being named a cardinal, which is, um, I mean, to me, it's really exciting. So it's so basically you have two, two cardinals that have ties to the U.S., but in both cases, it's complicated. And I think mm -hmm. Archbishop Pierre would never consider himself an American. He's a, he's yeah, a, more that outsiders. <laughs> he's French. And I think, you know, so it's, um, and that was one of the things that I've, I've joked about before when it comes to the attention that's paid by the Vatican to the U S church. It's like, we have a, an Argentine Pope and a French nuncio. Like hmm. if, if there's any, if there are any two countries that are going to, uh, try to put the U S in its place, it would be those. So I think that that's, um, but, it, you know, congratulations to Archbishop Pierre, and I think it's an excellent choice. Um, the reason why the number is 18, so um, basically Pope Francis has been in the tradition of once the number dips below the cap set by Paul VI of 120, uh, he will appoint a new round. Mm -hmm. um, they're no longer voting cardinals once they reach 80. Um, and so... When he did it a couple of years ago, I think I think there were about 18 at the time, too. But mm -hmm. I think, you know, the, the average age of a cardinal is probably about 70 and every year, maybe 10 or so age out. 
And so every couple of years, they'll name about 20. Um, John Paul II named something like 40 back in 2001. It was the second to last consistory. Um, and that brought the number of voting cardinals up to 135. And I believe this new consistory brings the number up to 136. Um, and of course, the Pope then waives that 120 number. And so we've never had, I mean, this this has only been in place since Paul VI, but we've never had more than 120 at a, con at a papal conclave. But um, just in case the Pope does waive that rule so that mm -hmm. there's no confusion when the when the election comes. So, you know, that this is all going to happen. We'll probably write about some of the, the cardinals that have been picked mm -hmm. where Peter is between now and September 30th. Obviously, that's going to be right on the eve, right on the doorstep of the Synod, yeah. which will be pretty exciting. And some of the some of the cardinals will be participants. So um, any uh, any brief comments about I remember seeing headlines by, um, I don't know, uh, tweets or whatever, people talking about him stacking the Cardinals in his favor or on his side. Uh, do you have a sense of how I mean, he I, has selected people, where they fall? It's interesting because I've asked this question of Austin Ivory and of others who are involved in the, you know, other Cardinals. Um, I've actually spoken to a couple of Cardinals about what they think uh, Pope Francis's approach is. Uh, one thing he's, he definitely tries to do is reflect the diversity of the global church. So mm -hmm. that's why we have cardinals in Tonga and cardinals in um, Mongolia and Madagascar. These are not population centers mm -hmm. of the church, but they are at the periphery. Um, Another thing that he does in the in the United States, the tradition had always been that Philadelphia had a cardinal, uh, Los Angeles had a cardinal, Detroit, St. Louis, um, Detroit and St. Louis kind of fell out of favor in terms of having cardinals. But, you know, to name a cardinal to Newark, San Diego, that's a little surprising. But in other countries, for example, he's he's jumped over the capital completely and he'll name a cardinal in um, instead of Milan, he'll name one in. Bologna or, or Como, or he he's even named the um, auxiliary bishop of Lisbon is a cardinal. Now, fortunately, the archbishop is also a cardinal, so, so there won't be any um, any, any fighting. But this uh, this auxiliary bishop is um, one of the people who's organizing the upcoming World Youth Day, and okay. he must have impressed the Pope in a certain way. Um, and that's what Austin Ivory said: is he he. Obviously, he doesn't know all of them intimately, mm -hmm. but he's met them. And to a certain extent, they have impressed him. Mm -hmm. And that is, that's what leads him to appoint people as cardinals. Uh, Archbishop Pierre is a, is a very unorthodox choice, I think, a sitting nuncio. He's done it before. He named the nuncio to, uh, I believe, to Iraq um, maybe five or six years ago. And then this time he's named several nuncios, including the nuncio to Italy, who's a Swiss archbishop. Um, okay. It's, I guess the thing is that there's no, there's no predictable step. If I get named the archbishop of New York, since I'm late, it won't happen, but that's right. not an automatic. It doesn't mean you're definitely going to be a cardinal. Mm -hmm. um, it's not always the most prestigious sees mm -hmm. that, that get it. So, and it's not always archbishops, it could be dioceses, you know, just okay. regular bishops. So, yeah. Um, is it ideological? Uh, I mean, the thing is, we don't have the culture war here, or we have a culture war here that isn't really present in Africa and certain parts of Asia. And so I think the dynamic is a little bit different in India. Um, mm -hmm. And so I think he's, he definitely has sent a message by the types of cardinals that he's picked in the United States in terms of whether or not they follow backwardism or uh, rigidity. He, he's trying to push against that. He's trying mm -hmm. to push against someone who has a synodal view of the church. Uh, when he named Cardinal McElroy uh, a couple of years ago, I wrote an article about, because other people were saying, well, this is just an insult to the U.S. bishops. You know, it's an insult to these archbishops. And but if you looked at it in terms of what uh, 
Bishop McElroy was trying to do in San Diego, which is a which is a diocese that's as big as many archdioceses, um, mm -hmm. he was setting his priorities according to the papal plan. And that's, um, you know, he he's one of the few U.S. bishops that's been outspoken about Laudato Si. He held a diocesan synod a few years ago because Pope Francis was encouraging synodality in the church. So these these kinds of things, I mean, you don't just get it because you you have a certain position. Mm -hmm. He has to uh, recognize something in you that make that would make him think that you would be a good choice to be a cardinal in the church. So speaking of diversity of opinions and rigidity, this past week or so, you published an article on where Peter is entitled, Has Father Altman Excommunicated Himself? He apparently called Francis an anti-pope during a conference for the Coalition for Cancelled Priests. What is that all about? Well, first of all, why don't we start with the video, which I, which I do have here. Um, we'll bring that up and you can hear for yourself. Now, this is uh, this was posted to YouTube two or three days ago. The conference took place about two weeks ago. Um, and this is a small portion, less than a minute, of what uh, Father Altman had to say. He was one of the keynote speakers. Here again, and understand a real pope solely is responsible for defending the deposit of faith, not making it up according to his own personal ideology. Therefore, it is 100% valid to say Bergoglio actually is an anti-pope. There have been 20 or 30 before him, but he's the worst of all. But again, don't take my word for it. Rather, take the word of Jesus, John the Baptist, 2,000 years of saints and martyrs, doctors of the church, popes and holy shepherds, like Cardinal St. Robert Bellarmine, bishop and doctor of the church. So, there you have it. Um, he described Pope Francis as an anti-pope. He framed this anti-pope in history, saying there have been this many before. He goes on to explain uh, St. Robert Bellarmine's uh, thesis for how one might determine if a pope has disqualified himself for heresy. Mm -hmm. And there's just no question that he is openly denying that Pope Francis is a valid pope. Um, and he's speaking at this conference where a lot of people are, have, were bashing the Pope. I don't know if any of them openly described him as an anti-Pope as well. Um, but it was one after another. It was people from the SSPX. It was people who write for Crisis Magazine. Peter Kwasniewski was one of the participants. Um, Father Altman, his entire speech, he called the bishops a brood of vipers and used profanity and homophobic slurs throughout the entire thing. I mean, it was, it, Who's it was this coalition. It's a canceled pre canceled <clears throat> by who priests canceled. by. Well, so I guess the idea is that there, and it's, it is a valid concern because when you are a priest, you are beholden to your superior. If you're in a religious order, you're beholden to your bishop. If you're a diocesan priest, um, there may be a complaint against you or your bishop may have a problem with you or you may be accused of something. There may be an incident. Now, I'm not talking about abuse necessarily. Um, if it's a case of abuse, there's a whole, especially abuse of minors, there's a whole set of procedures that need to be followed. It needs to be reported. It needs to be documented. It needs to be followed up on. And there's there are accountability checks. But let's say you get in, you're a priest you're an associate pastor, maybe you get into a conflict with with your pastor. You get into conflict with um, prominent, longstanding parishioners who have some clout in the diocese or know the bishop. And then all of a sudden you find yourself without an assignment one day or you mm -hmm. find yourself out of active ministry or mm -hmm. you get accused of sexual harassment. And there's, uh, you know, there are no charges. There's no hearing. And in theory, you are, you know, but you don't, you're not allowed to return to active ministry because you're beholden to the bishop to make that decision. Um, and so the validity of these concerns is a question. Um, in some cases, the priests have been obstinately opposed to their bishops. They haven't um, followed instructions. Uh, one of the more well-documented cases is Father Altman. He, um, I mean, we saw his political statements uh, a few months into, I think, 20, 
or I think I think towards the end of 2020, his bishop actually wrote a public letter and said that this behavior is not compatible with being a priest of the Diocese of La Crosse. And Father Altman was, uh, so he had this public warning and he said that he was going to work to resolve the problem with Father Altman in private. Mm -hmm. And this clearly didn't work. Father Altman escalated his behavior. And on July 9th, I, I noticed that the two year anniversary was yesterday. Um, he was removed from his pastorship. He mm -hmm. said that he was going to fight it. Um, it's been two years. Usually the process takes around a year, maybe a little bit more than a year um, mm -hmm. because pastors have canonical rights. They can, if something, if there's an injustice done against them, they can essentially appeal to the Vatican. Mm -hmm. So, so we don't know the status of his appeal or. Oh, well, so, okay. Fall. So this is actually something that I, that I um, did. I guess this is the scoop that came out of the article besides this okay. very public statement of being a set of a contest. Um, I was curious, uh, you know, it's been two years. Why haven't we heard mm -hmm. the results of this investigation? So I went to the parish website and I went to the diocesan website and I noticed that so one of the canon laws is basically when you are undergoing this appeal process, they can't name a pastor of mm -hmm. the parish. They put in a parochial administrator, like they remove him. Mm -hmm. They put in a temporary administrator who fills in for the pastor until the situation is resolved. Mm -hmm. Well, I noticed that on that in November 2022, in November of last year, the priest who had been serving as the parochial administrator of St. James the Less Parish in La Crosse mm -hmm. was promoted to pastor of the parish. Which oh. what that says to me is that at least that part of the appeal was pretty definitive. Definitive. He must have lost that. So then mm -hmm. why is Father why have we not heard this publicly? Mm -hmm. And why is Father Altman still saying outrageous things and and now declared himself essentially in in schism? Um, well, it seems, that, I mean, if I had to guess, you know, this, I mean, honestly, that, that one little declaration is nothing compared to all the other appearances he's made at various events and on social media. Mm -hmm. Um, and my guess is that they are pursuing further sanctions, uh, whether it's being defrocked like father Frank Pavone was, or, um, I mean, this recent statement I think is grounds for automatic excommunication. And one of the things that I did, excommunications formally are very rare mm -hmm. in, um, especially of a public nature of priests in the, in the world today, in the church today, but the few that have been excommunicated, and I note a few cases, it's cases where uh, they have denied that Francis is the Pope, thereby breaking communion with him going into formal schism, which is, I mean, the definition of schism is the refusal of submission to the Roman pontiff. Um, and so local bishops have declared decrees of excommunication, basically saying this person excommunicated him or herself mm -hmm. because they broke with the Pope. Yeah. Um, now there are other people out there. I mean, Vigano has never had any canonical sanctions against him that I've ever seen. Um, there, uh, the 100 year old emeritus Bishop of Corpus Christi uh, denied that Francis was Pope. And, you know, he still appears on the diocesan webpage as our Bishop Emeritus. Uh, I don't think he's terribly active and, you know, he is a hundred, but um, you know, it, it's hit or miss whether something happens or not. But mm -hmm. I, I want to say, I mean, I just have a gut feeling that something must be in the works. Uh, especially I was going to ask, do you think anything will happen next because of all this? Um, I, I think there would have to be some kind of public resolution. Um, I think I think uh, defrocking and excommunication um, definitely would be on the table. It's it's up to his bishop, but uh, pretty much everything he says, I think, fits that that description uh, or warrants that uh, penalty. Um, but honestly, I mean, if if you watch the entire talk or if you watch any of his recent videos. He goes from being pleasant and chuckling and um, 
emo, you know, uh, sad or somber to all of a sudden snarling and and angry and and almost out of control and using profanity. And I, I mean, part of me wonders if I mean, I I think he, he may be in a situation where he needs emotional um, and psychological help. I'm not a, I'm not a, a you know a psychiatrist or psychologist, but mm -hmm. honestly, I it's it's such a sad case to see this kind of extremism and vitriol coming from someone who gave his life to the church. Um, mm -hmm. I mean, I I think ultimately what it comes down to is to to pray for him and to pray for the souls who somehow think that he's a truth teller or that he's telling or that he's using common sense. Mm -hmm. um, so that's, uh, I think that's all I have for this week. If you want to end on that, yeah. <laughs> on that happy well, note. And, and again, you've crafted all of this into an article so folk can check out the links in the description to go read up on this. And then uh, uh, the other links to the topics that we covered, they are also in the description. So thanks again for the debrief, Mike. Uh, this conversation is brought to you from smartcatholics.com, the free online community for millennials, creators, and learners. Join our private Where Peter Is group to ask questions, share insights, and suggest topics for next time. And visit wherepeteris.com to read articles, commentaries, spiritual reflections by and for faithful Catholics who support the mission and vision of Pope Francis. Please share this episode with uh, friends or family or people that you think uh, are going to appreciate hearing this and do hit the subscribe button so that you never miss an episode of the deep brief. And if you would like to support where Peter is, please uh, sign up to be a Patreon sponsor. Yeah. Thank you. Please do actively consider that friends. And thank you for joining us when it comes to news and controversies in the Catholic church, stay curious, informed, and engaged. <laughs>